much. So my uh, second topic today is on drug toxicity in inflammatory bowel disease. I think this is a very important topic. Uh, we mentioned some of the implications in pregnancy, but what you see far more often is the non-pregnant patient, obviously. So I'd like to touch on some of the uh, different risks and benefits of some of these drugs. Um, and we'll also talk about some, some tricks and how to manipulate the drugs to minimize toxicity, which is also very helpful in practice. So a few concepts I think are important to, uh, uh, to discuss before getting into the specifics of medical therapy. So the first question that has uh, been the source of a lot of, uh, a lot of publications in the past 10 or 15 years is, should we be aggressive? So historically, people have believed in uh, treating once someone is particularly symptomatic, and that's true of most diseases. Uh, we've also historically believed not only in inflammatory bowel disease, but also in other diseases that have a chronic inflammatory nature, like um, COPD or emphysema or asthma, that we should step up therapy, start with mild therapy as people have mild disease, and then slowly use more aggressive therapy as time goes on. And then finally, we've always historically uh, been taught in most diseases to start with one drug, try to maximize its utility, and then perhaps add a second drug or replace it. There is a lot of data in the past few years that perhaps suggests that we should be more aggressive. And I'll show you some slides that um, will hopefully lead you to uh, at least uh, consider the possibility of treating early rather than late, of using what we call top-down therapy versus step-up therapy, and finally, whether we should start with two drugs instead of one. And whenever we're talking about drug toxicity, on a larger scale, it's important to weigh the risks and benefits of treatment for inflammatory bowel disease. And I think a lot of times we, get, um, we focus on these first two, which is the risks of treatment and the benefits of treatment. But I'd like to also emphasize this third point, which is the risks of no treatment. So again, we often talk about the Hippocratic Oath and at first do no harm. I'd like to impart at least to, to a degree that sometimes doing nothing perhaps is the most harm. And I'll show you some data that perhaps by being more aggressive um, with some of these drugs that we can actually in the long run create less toxicity overall for the patient. So the first question was whether we should treat early or treat late. So this is a very famous slide that you may have seen before from the French. Uh, it's now over 10 years old. Looking at the likelihood of different phenotypes of disease at certain, time, uh, at certain points after diagnosis. And what you can see here is that in the first several years after diagnosis, the great majority of people tend to have inflammatory disease, what you normally see on colonoscopy with ulcers in the right colon and the cecum and the ileum. A small percentage may have stricturing or fibrostenotic disease, for example, a small bowel stricture, and uh, the rest have penetrating disease, so internal fistulas, perhaps some perianal disease as well. What you'll notice here is over the course of the next 10 to 15 to 20 years, the phenotypes somewhat change in that you have much more likely later in disease to have a lot more penetrating and stricturing disease and a lot less, anti and a lot less inflammatory disease. So if one to, to make the argument about when it would be most ideal to treat patients, generally speaking, the best, the best opportunity that we have to treat these patients, since they are anti-inflammatory drugs, is treat them when the, most, when the majority of them have inflammatory disease, which is what you see on the left of this graph. And we're probably, we probably have the le lowest potential or least potential for adequate treatment when they're in the right side of this, disease, uh, of, of this chart. So I think this is one piece of evidence that suggests that because we have strong anti-inflammatory therapy, the earlier we treat, the greater potential we have to, um, to affect change in a positive way and make the patient feel better and hopefully change the natural history of the disease. So this suggests that perhaps treating early is uh, superior to treating late. What about starting with mild drugs, perhaps the mesalamines, maximizing the mesalamines, then moving to thiopurines, maximizing those, then adding anti-TNFs or replacing the previous drugs with those. So this study from now uh, five years ago, almost five years ago, from the Belgian group, uh, was a very famous study that was in the Lancet. It was called the top-down versus step-up approach. And I would focus on this graph on these two lines. And, and the y-axis, it's you see here the proportion of patients that do not have relapse. And you looked at, in this, uh, they took people that had relatively active disease, a Crohn's disease activity index of more than 200, and importantly, these are people that had never received either thiopurines or biologics before. So they had never received azathioprine or TNFs. They came in with moderate, moderate to severe Crohn's disease, and they were randomized either to receive both azathioprine and infliximab and eventually taper down, or start with the milder drugs and step up therapy as needed. 
And without going into too many of the specifics of the paper, this graph I think is, um, illustrates best that when you treat with early combined immunosuppression, what you see uh, in the green line, that there is a significantly higher chance that they will be without relapse or do well than if you use conventional management, which was historically starting again with the mesalamines and slowly stepping up with a significant p-value. This suggests that perhaps we should be more aggressive up front and give them stronger drugs, drugs early to again hopefully change the natural history of the disease rather than trying to step up therapy and in the process let inflammation persist and turn inflammatory disease into stricturing disease. The final question about whether to use one drug or two, drug, two drugs has been the, uh, a very hot topic in the past several American major GI meetings and this is whether we should use monotherapy, meaning either azathioprine or an anti-TNF, most studies have used infliximab, uh, versus dual therapy, using both a thiopurine and an anti-TNF. And these are the, uh, the, the, the most important charts from the famous Sonic study by Dr. Sanborn and his colleagues published in the New England Journal of Medicine two years ago, basically showing that combination therapy of infliximab along with azathioprine, compared to, uh, to infliximab alone or azathioprine alone, was statistically significantly better at achieving steroid-free clinical remission, which was defined as having a Crohn's disease activity index of less than 150, or basically feeling well. And not only that, but we now, since we now believe that a lot of things like inflammation and eventually strictures and, and fistulae and even cancer are probably related to chronic inflammation, this was also the group that received both drugs was much more likely to have mucosal healing, meaning not only are we making them feeling better, but their colon looks better, even newer studies show that they can get into deep remission where even their biopsies look normal, all suggesting that we're improving their natural history. So this was the biggest piece of evidence that people were waiting for for years about uh, starting dual therapy, meaning an anti-TNF with a thiopurine rather than either alone. Again, importantly, in this study, they had moderate to severe disease and they were naive to both drugs, the azathioprine group and the anti-TNF group. So you cannot extrapolate this data to a patient of yours who's on 6MP and progressively doing worse. This is not necessarily the context in which this study was done. And then uh, Dr. Panaccioni in Canada uh, presented last year at the European Crohn's disease meeting, uh, not yet published in, um, in, a, in a journal, but called a success trial where similar fi findings were found in ulcerative colitis. Again, suggesting that dual therapy perhaps may be better than monotherapy. And when you use dual therapy with methotrexate instead of azathioprine along with an anti-TNF, that study did not achieve statistical significance but their methods were different. Without getting too much into it, basically they had given everybody prednisone, so everyone felt better soon, so it was hard for them to achieve statistical significance. Nonetheless, we have a great amount of data now to suggest that in those people that have never received either thiopurines or anti-TNFs, if they have moderate to severe disease, they do better with both drugs rather than either drug alone. So what I've hopefully presented, uh, presented to you is that there are several data that suggest that we should treat earlier in the disease that we should treat aggressively with stronger drugs and treat with combined rather than, th than in each individual drug by itself. So the obvious next question, if you're treating earlier, treating longer, treating stronger with stronger drugs and treating with combination therapy, is are we asking for problems? Are we asking for toxicity of these drugs? And that's what I hope to, uh, to convey to you today uh, with some data. So I'll present to you a case um, that I recently saw of a 26-year-old gentleman with two months of right lower quadrant pain and loose stool. He therefore underwent colonos colonoscopic evaluation, um, and he had inflammation both in the ileum and the cecum. Biopsies showed some inflammation and gran granulomatous disease, and cultures ruled out uh, infection as the cause of his symptoms. He was therefore diagnosed with ileocolonic Crohn's disease, and we had started him on budesonide, which is a topical anti-inflammatory steroid, along with azathioprine. <clears throat> he, uh, four weeks later, presented to the emergency room with significant nausea, vomiting, and epigastric pain with markedly elevated amylase and lipase, and was diagnosed with severe pancreatitis. So some important questions. So what are the major risks of the principal drug classes in inflammatory bowel disease? And importantly, how can we exploit our understanding of these drugs to either circumvent or minimize these risks when we understand the metabolic pathways that are involved? And finally, are there risks not only of administering therapy, but something we think about far less often, are there risks of withholding therapy? Um, I think that's as important of a question as the risks of the therapies themselves. So we'll go drug by drug, similar to how we did with pregnancy. And in mesalamine, there's actually no significant immunosuppression. We mentioned that sulfasalazine may decrease sperm motility 
and there are the inherent side effects of any drug that contains sulfa, so the things like headache and nausea that you may see in many of your patients that are on sulfa drugs, whether they're sulfasalazine or, um, or another sulfa drug. But other than that, the most common side effects are relatively uncommon. Diarrhea, headache, nonspecific muscle and joint pain can be seen with all of the mesalamines. There have been some reported cases of mesalamine-induced pancreatitis, um, although not a large number. But I think the overall take-home point for the mesalamines is that overall, they're very safe. Uh, these are certainly you should be your drug of choice in mild to moderate ulcerative colitis. Uh, there's not really any great data that they work in Crohn's disease that involves a small bowel, although that's commonly used, but certainly in ulcerative colitis and colonic, uh, isolated colonic Crohn's disease, mesalamines are very effective and are very safe with very minimal toxicity, as I'm sure you, most of you have experienced. And even if somebody does have specific side effects like diarrhea or headache, oftentimes you can change drugs in the class and achieve a better effect, much like we can with PPIs. So there's not, they're not necessarily all class effect. Moving on to steroids. Steroids, um, as, uh, as many of you may have experienced, are probably the best drug at inducing remission early. In fact, even better than anti-TNFs in terms of early response, which is why they're so commonly used. Unfortunately, it's a very broad immunosuppression. So unlike just targeting purine synthesis, like the thiopurines do, just targeting folic acid, um, involved uh, metabolic pathways like methotrexate, or just involving TNF, like the biologics, this pretty much uh, shuts down all mechanism, mechanisms in the immune system, so there's very broad immunosuppression. While that may be helpful to treat disease, it unfortunately leads to a lot of problems, the two biggest of which are infections, and I capitalize there because I think it's important to, to understand possibly the increase in mortality as well. Understandably, there's not really an increased risk, risk of lymphoma as steroids are used as part of the most common chemotherapeutic regimens for lymphoma, but certainly infections and mortality and uh, this slide here illustrates both those points. On the top of the slide, you see here, this is a, a study from the Mayo, the Mayo Clinic from a few years ago, looking at the risk of infection with different classes of drugs. And I circled here in red that we see that when you use corticosteroids, your risk of infection is statistically significant. Uh, and when you use thiopurines, it is an increased risk of infection, but even more so when you add um, steroids to in, um, the thiopurines. Infliximab alone was pretty safe, as was, um, as was thiopurine with infliximab or dual therapy. But then when you added steroids, you can see that the, there's a marked increase in infection. The take home point being that the biggest driver of increased infections is not the thiopurine and is not the infliximab uh, in this study, it was actually the steroids. That's not to say these drugs have no infectious risk, but the biggest risk is likely with the steroids. On the bottom left of the slide, you see a study done by, um, by a group from Penn, from the University of Pennsylvania in the U.S., uh, published also in the same year. And you see here that when you have someone that was currently using corticosteroids, the risk of mortality in both Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis was statistically significant. Conversely, in those people that were on a thiopurine like azathioprine or um, 6 mercaptopurine this was not found. It was perhaps protective, although I wouldn't say that because it's not statistically significant, but certainly not an increased risk like you see with steroids. So those steroids are very effective at inducing remission. They are not effective for maintenance of remission, which is important, and furthermore, increase infections and mortality in the long run. So I think our goal should not only be to induce symptom remission, which is um, I, what makes patients feel better, but importantly to induce steroid-free symptom remission. So what about the thiopurines, uh, azathioprine and 6-MP, with an advertisement for Sony? Okay, sorry about that. So the thiopurines, the, the two major drugs in this class are azathioprine and 6-mercaptopurine. I think it's very important to understand the basic uh, metabolic pathways of thiopurines, and that'll help you gain a much better understanding of the side effects and also how we can circumvent some of these side effects by, cha by, um, by changing the dosing and timing it and co-administration co of different drugs. So I think the first important point to appreciate is that there are two different types of drug reactions, and this is true in drug toxicity in general. When you're talking about hepatotoxicity of, of many drugs, or in this case, IBD-related um, drug toxicity. There are idiosyncratic reactions that happen independent of dose or timing, and then there are the dose-dependent toxicities that happen as a certain metabolite accumulates. For the thiopurines, both of those exist. The two, um, we'll talk about them in the next slide. In the idiosyncratic group, things like pancreatitis and fever um, occur, and then in the dose-dependent group, you have most commonly myelosuppression and hepatotoxicity. So I'll point your attention to here on the left of this, of this metabolic pathway, you have azathioprine, 
which gets converted non-enzymatically into 6-MP. So it doesn't really matter which drug you use. And then in the erythrocyte, there's TPMT, which we'll discuss, that, um, that can convert this to 6-MMP. And then you have H, uh, HPRT, which can convert it to 6-TG. There's another uh, enzyme, xanthine oxidase, that can convert it to a third, uh, a third metabolic pathway of 6-TU. So you have 6-TU, which has really no important effects. 6-TG, which is very important because, num uh, because a number of greater than 235 is most likely to induce and maintain remission in Crohn's disease. Um, but unfortunately, that is also the metabolite that induces myelosuppression. And then finally, 6-MMP is, is not really therapeutic, but increased doses of 6-MMP can lead to hepatotoxicity. So again, the idiosyncratic reactions are, can be pancreatitis, you can also have nausea and vomiting as a side effect of this drug that's not truly from pancreatitis, but just from a reaction to the drug. These are people that'll have normal amylase and lipase. You can have, like our patient had, legitimate ele elevation of the pancreatic enzymes as well as typical symptoms consistent with pancreatitis. You can also get an idiosyncratic fever that usually gets better over time, but sometimes it's intolerable for patients, and infrequently get, an, uh, get a, a rash as well. The major dose-dependent reactions, as we just discussed, are hepatotoxicity and myelosuppression. So there's n nothing we can really do about the idiosyncratic reactions. Perhaps with more genome studies, we'll be able to understand people that are at greater risk for some of these. But in 2012, we don't really have the ability to predict who's going to get pancreatitis or fever or rash. So we just have to start the drug and see if they are susceptible to that. But we can do a lot to try to minimize the risk of both hepatotoxicity and myelosuppression. And the best way we can do that is by exploiting our understanding of the metabolism to check a TPMT level. So in hepatotoxicity, you see, um, sorry, back to the previous slide, that if you have a very high TPMT level, which is right here, then that'll drive most of your azathioprine and 6-MP down towards 6-MMP because of a very active TPMT. That can lead to hepatotoxicity without much benefit in terms of therapy. Conversely, if you have a very low TPMT, that is a double-edged sword. The benefit of a low TPMT is that most of the, of the medicine goes towards 6-TG, which is the therapeutic metabolite. Unfortunately, if you have a low TPMT, because so much of it goes to the therapeutic metabolite, since that's also the myelosuppressive metabolite, they can get profoundly leukopenic uh, and thrombocytopenic and, uh, and get an anemia, basically a severe pancytopenia that can put them at risk for significant infections and bleeding. So how can we overcome some of these toxicities? So I mentioned that we can't really overcome the idiosyncratic, this idiosyncratic toxicities, but one very helpful tool is to check a TPMT level, the enzyme level, prior to initiating therapy with azathioprine or 6-MP. We know from studies from decades ago that nearly 90% of people have normal levels of TPMT. About 10% are heterozygous for the TPMT mutation and have a, a middle, middle range level of, of TPMT activity. And about one in a thousand people have very low levels of TPMT. And the reason that we check this enzyme is if you happen to be in, in that one in a thousand people who have very low levels, then you will get profoundly ele elevated levels of 6-TG, which though therapeutic, are profoundly myelosuppressive. And we've seen patients with platelet counts of 2,000 and a hemoglobin of three and a white count that's undetectable who are at risk for neutropenic fever. So TPMT, because of, uh, by, by understanding the met metabolic pathways, if you know that someone has low P P TPMT, that could help predict early leukopenia. If you have a normal TPMT level, you should have greater satisfaction in knowing that you will unlikely lead that person down the road of, se of severe, dangerous myelosuppression. So perhaps you can decrease how frequently you check their CBCs, their hemoglobin platelets and white blood cell counts. And that could be very early, in, uh, very helpful in predicting, predicting early leukopenia. I would like to emphasize, though, that after about 8 to 12 weeks of administration, if they get leukopenia after that, for example, 6 or 7 months later, it could be from the metabolic pathway, but don't forget to consider things like infection. For example, parvovirus can cause a pancytopenia. And if they get leukopenia later on in their, um, in, uh, several months after using the drug, then rule out infection before presuming it's due to uh, a low P TPMT level. And then finally, we can actually, actually check. Uh, there, there are proprietary ways in the United States through a company called Prometheus, and now some generic ways as well, to check 6-thioguanine and 6-MMP levels. Um, so to go back two slides, we can actually check these two metabolites of 6-MMP and 6-TG. 
and that can help us determine what someone's risk is. We know that our goal is always to get someone to a 6TG above 235, and when we look at the 6TG and 6MMP, which are actually accurate two to three weeks after the administration of drug, uh, then we can note both the values and the ratio of these metabolites and use them to minimize toxicity. Uh, I would emphasize that the TPMT levels, you can order either a phenotype level or an actual genetic test for it. Unless somebody, re because this is a test of TPMT levels in erythrocytes, the only time it's really not valid to get a phenotype is if they've recently had a blood transfusion with somebody else's erythrocytes. If they haven't had a recent blood transfusion in the previous several weeks, then it's cheaper, more cost-effective, and, uh, and equally overall efficacious to just check the TPMT level. If they've recently had a blood transfusion, then you can check the genes. There's great overlap, as this study from nearly over 30 years ago shows you, that if somebody has hom homozygosity for the mutation in TPMT, they have virtually no TPMT and are at very high risk for complications. So strongly consider using another drug entirely and don't even use this class of drugs. You see here that people that either have normal, uh, normal genotype or, heteroz or heterozygotes mostly fall in this safe area. And then people that are very high, le high level of TPMT is again a double-edged sword in that they won't get myelosuppression, which is great because you won't put them at risk for pancytopenia, but because they have a very high TPMT level, almost everything will go to 6-MMP and it will be very hard to get them to a therapeutic level. So though it's safer, it generally tends to not work as well. And that was highlighted by this study by the pediatric gastroenterologists at Hopkins, at Johns Hopkins in, um, in the United States nearly a decade ago that showed that if you have a low level of TPMT, though we consider that dangerous because it's myelosuppression, that's what also helps you get therapeutic and people with a TPMT of less than 12 were far more likely to get to gain response from thiopurines like azathioprine versus those that had a higher TPMT level. So the ideal patient has a normal TPMT, but perhaps on the lower side, that would be the best combination of guaranteeing good efficacy while minimizing toxicity. So if someone has a very low TPMT, I would strongly uh, consider using other therapies. And on the other end of the spectrum, if someone has a very high TPMT, you can certainly try azathioprine. It'll be very safe, uh, but realize that you will, will be have, probably have a tough time getting to a therapeutic range and may want to consider another medication. And again, here you saw it was six times more likely um, in patients that had a low TPMT level to respond to azathioprine compared to those that had a higher level greater than 12. So minimizing toxicity. We try to get the goal of 6TG above 235. Interestingly, for reasons that I can't fully explain to you, azathioprine is sometimes better tolerated than 6MP. We can sometimes split the dose. So instead of giving it once daily, we can give it twice daily. That sometimes, that has been shown in a couple studies to actually normalize the amino transferases in people that have high uh, 6 MMP levels. Another important point is when you get the, meta the metabolites back, if the 6 MMP, which is hepatotoxic, is very high, and the number that our lab uses is more than 5,700, it may be different when you get your assays here. Even if that number is high, putting them at risk for hepatotoxicity, you do not need to stop or change the drug unless they have elevation of AST and ALT. Because there are populations of people that have very high 6 MMP levels, for which you may be concerned for hepatotoxicity, but if, um, but if they have a normal AST and ALT, they have no active hepatocellular damage, and they're at no risk for long-term hepatotoxicity. So we can continue those people on the drug and follow them carefully. Finally, if they have a high TPMT level, you would, um, you would expect them to have a lot of 6 MMP and not too much 6 TG, so that ratio would be very high. So how can we exploit that? So that is unfortunate for the patient that they probably won't get therapeutic. So several years ago, to go back to the, uh, this slide here, uh, some investigators realized that if you were to block xanthian oxidase with a common gout medication like allopurinol, then in those people who had a really active TPMT level, you would shunt all of the xanthian oxidase-driven metabolites down towards 6-TG, and that helped flip that ratio of 6-MMP to 6-TG. So in those people in whom uh, azathioprine is safe, but is not getting to an effective dose and not getting to an, eff uh, an effective 6-TG level, we can use something like allopurinol, and some studies have also suggested uh, mesalamines at blo by blocking xanthine oxidase to get a more therapeutic level and still maintain safety. So important things that can help you utilize the thiopurines before just saying, I tried 50 milligrams a day, they didn't feel better, before abandoning that therapy 
there are a lot of things you could do to manipulate the drug to maximize its effect while minimizing toxicity. So the other important uh, points about thiopurines is the risk of lymphoma. There have been many studies looking at thiopurines and lymphoma, several single, single center studies, a few population-based studies, two recent meta-analyses. Perhaps the most convincing data is the SESAM cohort. I showed you some data about pregnancy and thiopurines in the previous talk. They show that the adjusted hazard ratio or risk of developing lymphoma was about five times the regular population that was not on thiopurines in terms of the risk of developing lymphoma. But, and I'm not sure I will, I guess it's coming up better on, on the screen, you can see that the highest risk of lymphoma was in the patients over 65 years of age. Whereas when you look at the, the, at the, um, the first two groups of, uh, of bars, people less than 50 and, and between 50 and 65 had a lower risk of progression of lymphoma. So most of that effect of the risk of thiopurines causing lymphoma is likely mostly in the elderly with um, no significant risk in the people under the age of 30. It is important to know that it does increase risk of skin cancer and dermatologists have actually elucidated the specific mechanism by these breakages in purine synthesis, how it leads to both basal and squamous cell carcinoma. This is a study um, from the University of North Carolina that was recently published just this year, showing that those people on thiopurines had an increased risk of non-melanoma skin cancer. You see here that in Crohn's disease, the, uh, it, it's, it, it's 1.99, and, um, and in ulcerative colitis, it's 1.63, both statistically significant for non-melanoma skin cancer. They did not find an increased risk of melanoma, but in, there was a risk for non-melanoma skin cancer, so it's important to have your patients, um, particularly if they're out in the sun a lot, to use sunscreen, uh, to do what you would normally do to patients, uh, tell patients that are in the sun a lot to minimize skin cancer, and also see a dermatologist with some regularity to do full body examinations. Luckily, non-melanoma skin cancers are invariably relatively easy to treat, so generally speaking, the risk of the non-melanoma skin cancer, if you're following them closely and removing them with your dermatologist, and encouraging them to use sunscreen and sun protective clothing tends to outweigh the risks of the skin cancer itself if they need the drug for the appropriate amount of immunosuppression for their inflammatory bowel disease. So in our patient, pancreatitis, as, we, as I showed you, is idiosyncratic, not dose dependent. So there's really nothing that I could have done to change the, change the dosing or uh, give concurrent allopurinol to change the ratios of 6 MMP to 6 TG. That's not actually what drives this. It's an idiosyncratic reaction. So because of, that, I, because of that and the severity of the pancreatitis, I abandoned uh, the thiopurines and switched to an anti-TNF agent and did not use concurrent therapy because uh, of the idiosyncratic nature of that reaction. And uh, he has remained steroid-free symptom remission for the past two years. So what about other immunomodulators? Cyclosporin, again, not very often used on an outpatient basis, usually used as an inpatient for severe colitis. There is an increased risk of lymphoma, but that's mostly from the transplant literature in an entity we call post-transplant lymphoproliferative disease. That tends to be mediated by the Epstein-Barr virus, by EBV. Uh, so most of the lymphoma that's seen in cyclosporin has been seen in the transplant patients. We have no good long-term IBD studies because, again, not many people take cyclosporin on a long-term outpatient basis. But they have shown in the transplant literature that if you stop the cyclosporin, um, you can actually regress the PTLD. Uh, the post-transplant lymphomas that are seen in these patients after transplant. There's neurotoxicity, so there's an increased risk of seizures, particularly if you're malnourished. Um, an, a a, a non-specific helpful way to check for that is check a total cholesterol. And if the cholesterol is less than 100 or 115, there's probably an increased risk of seizures, and you can consider either not using this drug or nourishing them first if you have the time. They can also, as with all calcineurin inhibitors, like cyclosporin and tacrolimus, can lead to nephrotoxicity, so renal function needs to be monitored. And finally, there is a risk of infection with all immunosuppressive drugs, but there's a particularly high risk of infection if someone already has anti-TNF in their system, and then you add cyclosporin, and I'll show that data to you um, in the next talk, but basically, if somebody has already been exposed to either cyclosporin or infliximab, the incremental benefit of adding the other drug is probably outweighed by the, by the profound increased risk of infection and post-surgical complications. Methotrexate has no clear signal for increased lymphoma. This isn't all that surprising since things like high-dose methotrexate are used for things like primary CNS lymphoma, so it's actually used to treat some lymphomas. No clear signal of increased lymphoma. We discussed this pregnancy category in the last talk and how it must be absolutely avoided in those people trying to conceive. Um, there's also a cumulative lifetime dosing of about one and a half to two to maybe even higher, three or four grams. 
after which you can get hepatic fibrosis, so liver chemistries need to be closely monitored, and you can also develop a hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Overall, relatively well tolerated. In the IBD population, the subcutaneous and intramuscular forms tend to be better, to be more efficacious than the oral forms that work very well in rheumatoid arthritis, but um, the risks are about the same in either, uh, in any of those three do uh, forms of administration. I have a long list here for anti-TNFs. Realize that a lot of these, um, these side effects in newer drugs are always longer because they've had to go and undergo much more scrutiny by regulatory agencies. So they find a lot more things. There's certainly an increased risk of fungal and mycobacterial infections. Uh, um, some of that is geography dependent. So in America, for example, by the Mississippi River, there's more, more histoplasmosis. In certain parts of the country, there may be more coccidiomycosis. Um, so it's geography dependent to some degree, but also remember, about, remember mycobacterial and fungal infections. Drug-induced lupus can occur. Uh, I put there, and this again is, there's no great data for this, but because you can't, you, you're, it's hard to fix complement without an FC portion. Sertalizumab pegol has no FC portion, so perhaps less drug-induced lupus. And not in head-to-head -head studies, but in observational studies, this appears to be the case. You should definitely avoid using this in demyelinating diseases. So if someone has known multiple sclerosis or another, um, another disease that involves demyelination, you should certainly avoid anti-TNFs. Having said that, you don't need to check an anti-nuclear antibody before starting this drug. There are many people who have ANA levels that are 1 to 320 or 1 to, uh, 1 to 160 or 1 to uh, 640, even high titer ANA levels. In the absence of known demyelination, it's okay to start an anti-TNF, and checking ANA does not help. We have in the U.S. FDA, a big FDA label that if you have class 3 or 4 heart failure, these are absolutely contraindicated. I think a lot of times it's important to understand context. This is not because any of the anti-TNF studies for Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis led to heart failure. It's because around the time of these studies, they realized that some degree of ischemic cardiomyopathy was driven by high TNF levels. So they did separate studies on using anti-TNF agents for heart failure and found that some of them got worse. And so by extrapolation, the FDA label now says that we should avoid it in class three and four heart failure. Uh, but you uncommonly will see our, our, our patient population with inflammatory bowel disease have significant cardiomyopathy, but if they do, it's okay to use as long as they don't have severe heart failure. Finally, antibody formation is probably the most common side effect. Uh, this will lead to attenuation or loss of response and can also lead to a reaction either at the injection site for the subcutaneous versions or the infusion site for infliximab. The antibody formation is highest with infliximab because it, it is a chimeric antibody. It's half mouse, half human. Um, adalimumab is human and sertolizumab pegol is humanized, but it's important to realize just because they're human, they're not you, so you will still, de you will still um, uh, develop an antibody reaction to it. Infliximab is probably around 12% or so, and the uh, subcutaneous forms, adalimumab and sertolizumab pegol, are probably um, in less than 5% range, but not zero. So you can get antibody formation with all of these. We do know that if you use maintenance dosing, so if you look at the earliest studies of anti-TNF agents, particularly infliximab with, um, with Crohn's disease back in the late 90s, in the accent studies, you would, you'll see that they thought you could just give a dose and then give another dose of infliximab as needed. We now know that when you give as needed dosing, it significantly increases your antibody formation, which can lead to both reactions and loss of response. So the best way to administer anti-TNF agents to minimize this effect is to give maintenance dosing. And we also know that a concurrent immunomodulator, probably better data for thiopurines, but data for both thiopurines and methotrexate, if you give these drugs along with anti-TNF, you can minimize antibody formation. So another reason to consider dual therapy. The TREAT registry, as I mentioned in the last talk, is a registry on, um, uh, that is, follows patients with infliximab. And Dr. Lichtenstein from the University of Pennsylvania recently published their, um, uh, uh, the most updated version of this registry. It's actually only in electronic publication, not yet in, uh, in journal form, but will be soon in the American Journal of Gastroenterology, showing that there is a slight increased risk of infection, but when separating, teasing that out, mo most, most of that likely came from steroids and narcotics and disease severity more so than anti-TNF alone, and no increased risk in mortality. And then another, another study done also by Dr. Lichtenstein this year, uh, was a meta-analysis of 10 inflammatory bowel disease trials in which he combined all the trials that, you, that, that studied infliximab and showed that there was, whether or not you used azathioprine, there was no increased risk in infection, mortality, or malignancy from the infliximab.
in the azathioprine plus infliximab UC patients, I'm sorry, in the azathioprine treated UC patients, there was an um, increased risk of infection, and the azathioprine treated Crohn's disease patients, more malignancy, but overall, there was no increased risk um, with infliximab in this meta-analysis of 10 large trials, uh, most of which were of relatively high quality. So some important points to minimize toxicity with anti-TNFs. Realize that infection is highest with steroids. So if you're, um, usually anti-TNFs can induce a response much more quickly than thiopurines. So if you plan on starting someone on an anti-TNF, they usually don't need a concurrent steroid bridge, uh, unlike with the azathioprine class, which usually takes 8 to 12 weeks to take full effect. So try to get them off steroids as quickly as you can, as quickly as you feel it's safe. Also remember the very important possibilities of reactivating hepatitis B and tuberculosis. Um, PPDs are commonly done in the U.S., but now we have a, a blood test that minimizes some of the false negatives called quantiferon. Um, so we regularly check quantiferon. If someone's positive or PPD positive, this is not people that have had tuberculosis and have been treated. That's much more of a gray area, but conceptually probably safer because they can't reactivate if it's already been adequately treated. But these are people who have been exposed to tuberculosis that have latent tuberculosis and the risk of reactivating it increases. So what the general recommendations are is if you can to start single drug therapy, isoniazid it for the treatment of latent tuberculosis for at least a couple of months of a lead-in before starting the anti-TNF therapy. For hepatitis B, uh, again, less of an issue in America because we've been routinely vaccinating um, all children for about the past 30 years, but certainly in other parts of the world, hepatitis B is still a major endemic problem. Uh, we routinely check surface antigen and surface antibody. The real recommendation is surface antigen because if they are surface antigen positive, and this is presuming they have no active, active hepatitis B, so maybe uh, you, you would check an HBV DNA, and if that's negative, then you can just give them suppressive therapy. Um, because they have no circulating DNA, lamivudine is usually adequate, but now with much more potent drugs like tenofovir, that's usually our drug of choice, and you can start that along with the anti-TNF agent. I put in parentheses, parentheses there, checking a total core antibody. I personally, and many other people that treat inflammatory bowel disease, check not only surface antigen, but also total core antibody, because in those that are surface antibody positive, surface antigen negative, and total core antibody positive, they were likely immunized by infection decades earlier and have natural immunity. However, they still have what we call CCC DNA, or closed circularly covalent DNA, in the hepatocyte. So there still exists a theoretical risk of reactivating that. That has been actually shown with the reactivation of hepatitis B in chemotherapy, people that were receiving chemotherapy for cancer. So for that reason, we, uh, many of us also check a total core antibody, and if that's positive, even if surface antibody is positive and surface antigen is negative, I still give concurrent tenofovir. Um, you can also use entecovir or lamivudine. Uh, lamivudine is generally not, res not first-line therapy for hepatitis B, but again, if it's, if it's a chronic carrier who has no active viremia, it's very unlikely to induce resistance. Finally, for the opportunistic infections, keep in mind where you live, um, and so different uh, opportunistic infections have a higher likelihood to occur in different parts of, the co of, of our country and in different parts of the world. Uh, in terms of anti-TNFs and skin cancer, I mentioned to you that thiopurines can increase the risk of non-melanoma skin cancer. Conversely, this is the same study from the University of North Carolina showing that anti-TNF agents, um, mostly in Crohn's disease, will increase the risk of, uh, of melanoma, so also important to routinely see a dermatologist for uh, checking for melanoma. In terms of lymphoma, there is an increased risk of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma in some studies, not so much in others. The problem with a lot of the, the studies looking at lymphoma in anti-TNF agents is that because of the relative, um, the anti-TNFs are relatively new, most of the people who have been exposed to anti-TNFs have also been exposed to thiopurines in the past. So it's hard to tease out how much of the risk of lymphoma is from thiopurines and how much is truly from the anti-TNFs. As with the thiopurines, it's probably a real but a small incremental risk. You see here some data from Corey Siegel from Dartmouth University um, in the U.S. showing that we have something called a SEER database, which is basically a large database of cancers in the United States. And what you see here on the, in the first column is that the rate of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma in the general population is about 2 out of 10,000 people. For immunomodulators, meaning thiopurines alone, about 4 out of 10,000. And with the, with the anti-TNFs, about 6 out of 10,000. Although, again, it's hard to say how much of that 6 came from exposure to thiopurines in the past. 
but this is a relative phenomenon. So what I tell my patients is that you're incrementally, incrementally increasing your risk from two out of 10,000 to four or six out of 10,000. That incremental risk is about one in 2,500 or one in 5,000, whereas I'm giving you a 60% chance of feeling a lot better or 6,000 out of 10,000. And I think it's important to put it in, in numbers that they can fully understand to, to, to explain to them the incremental risk versus the large incremental benefit. Um, this is some data just um, not even published yet, but from Dr. Lewis at the University of Pennsylvania from DDW two months ago, showing that the risk of death or cancer is not higher in the anti-TNF group compared to azathioprine alone. So when you look at the hazard ratios, the risk of death, solid cancer, and um, undefined lymphoma and non-melanoma skin cancer, the risks are no higher with anti-TNFs, as you see here, than they are with thiopurines. <clears throat> I wanted to at least put up one slide on a concern for a lot of people, which is hepatosplenic T-cell lymphoma. There are very few cases, single dig uh, double-digit cases, but inv unfortunately invariably fatal. Uh, it's almost exclusively, though not, though not exclusively, almost always seen in young men between the ages of 16 and 22 or so, and has generally occurred with those on anti-TNF therapy along with thiopurines. This is a concern, but the overall r uh, rate of development is exceedingly low. It's only a few cases per year in the entirety of the United States. So um, it is an important point and perhaps a reason to avoid dual therapy in very young males. But again, it's as with everything, a balance of risk and benefits. And the only group of, of patients in whom I have a long conversation about this um, to discuss this are the males under the age of 22 or so. After that, I think that the benefits tend to outweigh the risks of using dual therapy with both anti-TNFs and a thiopurine. So I'll, I'll finish with a couple slides that, um, that are a little different than what we've been talking about. We've been talking for a lot about the toxicity of drugs, but I would like to propose to you that perhaps there's greater toxicity in doing nothing, or not doing nothing, but treating with milder drugs. So what is the risk of not treating? So this is an interesting study um, that just came out a couple of months ago in the American Journal of Gastroenterology. Uh, and again, hopefully it's not too hard to see there, but basically if I can uh, summarize the numbers, you can see that the, that the risk of lymphoma is uh, the number needed to harm. So how many people do you have to give these drugs to to cause one lymphoma? So you have to give, the, you have to give azathioprine to over 4,000 people to cause one lymphoma. You have to give uh, azathioprine to 350 uh, patients over the age of 65 to cause one lymphoma. You have to give anti-TNF agents to almost 2,500 people to cause a lymphoma. So those are all concerning. But if you look at the number of, um, of people needed to harm to induce one more hospitalization, to induce one more surgery, or to induce, um, what was the last one? One more, sur um, yeah, those are the two major ones. And to induce another relapse, these numbers needed to harm are a lot lower. So basically, the point of this slide is sure that one out of every 3,000 patients will get lymphoma, but if you don't treat them, one out of three will have a relapse, one out of seven will have a hospitalization, and one out of 14 will need surgery. So it's important to understand the incremental risks and benefits of these drugs. This is a study from Hungary looking at the rate of azathioprine use, and it goes by decade. You see on the left side that in the past three decades, azathioprine use has incrementally increased, and along with that, they've seen a, um, a, a decrease in the rate of surgeries. So though this is obviously not a causal study, the suggestion here is that the more they've used azathioprine, the more they've used immunomodulators, the more they've changed the natural history, and fewer surgeries are needed. Obviously, a lot of variables in a study like this, so it's no, by no means definitive, but I hope it's thought-provoking um, to realize there's not only risks of giving drugs, but also of withholding drugs. Finally, this is um, just from, I think, last month in gastroenterology, a massive cohort. One of the advantages that, that Scandinavian countries have with socialized medicine is that they can produce massive cohorts of patients in celiac disease and inflammatory bowel disease. This looked at 178 million patient years, basically the entire country over the past few decades, and the rate of colon cancer in patients with ulcerative colitis in the past 10 years or so is actually not that much different than the general population, suggesting that perhaps the fact that we're much more aggressive now, whether with high-dose mesalamines or increased screening um, or, uh, or better drugs like thiopurines and anti-TNFs, that we may have changed the natural history of the disease. I will tell you that there was another paper in this, in this same issue that suggested that in California that, that this was not nearly as impressive, and in fact there still is an increased risk of cancer and ulcerative colitis. So by no means am I telling you to stop surveilling people for, ulcerative, for cancer in ulcerative colitis. By no means am I telling you that you should, you should think that ulcerative colitis is not causing cancer, but I do think this is interesting and provocative data that are we perhaps changing the natural history of the disease such that by treating people more aggressively we may be lowering the risk of cancer.
in this patient population. So final thoughts, all medical therapies have toxicity. If you take too much aspirin, you can get an ulcer. If you drink too much water, you can get hyponatremic. So nothing is truly without toxicity. The weight of the data does support early and aggressive therapy uh, for those with moderate to severe disease. And this is mostly in the Crohn's, uh, Crohn's patients, but to some degree in ulcerative colitis as well. Generally speaking, the risks are outweighed by the benefits in that patient population. What I didn't get into, I referenced the two studies there for your, um, for your information. But basically, it's great that we're putting people on combination therapy, but now what? Now they've been on combination therapy for a year, they're 25 years old, and they feel great. Are you going to subject them to both drugs for the next 60 years? We don't really know the answer to that yet. The IMIS study stopped the 6MP, and the STORY trial stopped the infliximab and left them on the other drug as monotherapy. And uh, without getting into too many specifics, they both had mixed results. So we're not really sure right now if we can stop a drug, and if so, um, it may, they may be okay for a year, but if three years later they need another drug again, it may be a problem. So we're unclear as to when to stop meds on combination therapy. And also please appreciate the risks of not treating aggressively. And my final uh, thing I'd like to convey to you is that I very much think that as people who treat inflammatory bowel disease, this is a patient population in whom I feel that we also need to be their primary care physician. I don't think we can expect the primary care physicians to understand this disease like we do. To that end, I make sure that I always ask my patients that they're, to make sure they're updated on their pap smears because of the increased risk of HPV-related cervical, um, cervical cancer, to get their mammograms if they're of the correct age, to appropriate skin cancer screening along with dermatology visits. If they've been exposed to steroids, get spine and hip bone density scans and give them appropriate osteopenic and osteoporotic prevention or treatment. Infectious precautions if they are in a particular high-risk areas or jobs that um, are increased risk of infection, and vaccinations. This includes the flu vaccine every year, the pneumococcal vaccine, even though, they're, even though they're not 65 yet, at least these are the recommendations of the American Infectious Disease Society, the HPV vaccine, um, and avoiding live vaccines if they're already on an anti-TNF. So I give, for example, the Zoster vaccine six weeks before starting the anti-TNF, so I don't have to worry about the risk of, of, of live vaccines with anti-TNFs. Thank you.